Made in Latin America. 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 Latin America. Welcome to Made in Latin America, a new podcast brought to you by the Santo Domingo Centre of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum. In this podcast, you'll be listening to insights and interpretations about iconic collections at the British Museum, as well as examples from the more than 60,000 items, of which many have never been on display. Join us in this series that will deepen and challenge what you know about Latin America. This season explores the Tolimteya Codex, one of the few surviving pre-Hispanic pictorial manuscripts made more than 500 years ago in the Mystic region in Mexico. In which language is it written? Why is its blue color so unique? What stories does it tell? The podcast will be hosted by two curators from the Latin America Center, Laura Osorio Sonax and Maria Mercedes Martinez Milanchi. Indigenous researchers, communities, and artists working with this codex will join us throughout the season. Hi, everybody. This is Mercedes and Laura from the Santo Domingo Center of Excellence for Latin American Research at the British Museum, and welcome to the Made in Latin America podcast. In this episode, we'll cover the use of hallucinogenic substances as they appear in the Donindeye Codex and the significance of those practices in Mesoamerican culture today. Just to remind you how it's going to work, me and Laura are going to have a conversation, and then we'll have some comments from different specialists, and throughout the episode, you'll be listening to a creative retelling of the Donindeye Codex read by Miguel Villegas Ventura. A long journey, a pilgrimage toward a powerful throne, the Toltec Quetzal like King Lord for Jawar, nearing with every step. Lord a deer, journeying with his loyal shadow twelve movement, and the power objects of Al, Arrow, and Skull Shield, and these men of many battles, of many journeys, now step further from home than they've been. And with that far off distance reach, a ceremony, a lavish ritual of crowning, the beating of drums for the making of a great man, the greatest among all men, save the Quetzal King himself. Old King makes new King by piercing septum, pushing a shard of sharpened bone through the middle of the nose, and placing in the hole that's made a dazzling beautiful turquoise ornament so there can be no doubt this man Lord a dear juggle claw is a king of new no this man of non-royal birth is royal now a new dynasty born without birth a lineage drawn with only one end picture Lord a dear with his turquoise dazzle nose sitting atop his royal throne atop his royal mat atop the royal dais lord 12 movement in his shadow with the brother and half brother lord nine flower and eight flower who laughed with lord eight deer on the side of the mountain before there was any talk of kings these three pledged their allegiance and laid three spears and three shields at the feet of the king and all the little lords from all the little places around lined the route in procession as far as you can see, waiting to come, to bow, to pay the respect to their new king, this new dynasty of eight deer. Picture as well space on the dais where no queen stands, and another where there should be children, but no children are there. Notice that space, just as everyone notices, but everyone else averts their eyes. A day of great triumph can escape great regret. So Laura, can you tell us a bit about the scene where the hallucinogenic ointment is used? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the scene in which Lord Eight Deer and Lord Twelve Movement prepare for Lord Eight Deer's voyage to the Temple of Death to visit Lady Nine Grass is on the same page, actually, of the Donin Dia Codex. What happens is there are a series of different preparations that need to happen um, so that uh, he and Lady Six Monkey are ready to enter this, I suppose, liminal space. And so they sacrifice a coyote, uh, they go to the mountain and the codex actually shows them wearing a kind of black ointment and probably represents a kind of 
trance-like state that Lord 8 Deer and Lord 12 Moment would have been in, which was all part of the, I suppose, psychological and spiritual, if you want, uh, preparation for, for this voyage. This engagement in in hallucinogens or engagement in the oniric world does happen frequently across quite a few of the, of the uh, Mishtek codices. It's not something that is an isolated and you know an isolated event it it was it was a way of engaging in a serious activity and that's something that happens at various points in the Tony Dea Codex and it happens um, certainly in the pictorial manuscripts from the Mishtek region that actually prescribe certain uh, ritual behaviors. What do you think is the purpose of this ointment or what do scholars believe the purpose is? The ointment uh, had, as I said, has had hallucinogenic properties. And the purpose was to, I think, inhabit uh, another reality. This is part of what is considered to be an oniric world, dream states or trance-like states. So if you um, see that very same page of the codex that I'm talking about when Lord 8 Deer and Lord 12 Movement go to the mountain and they are wearing the ointment and then later when Lady Six Monkey and Lord 8 Deer are travelling to the Temple of Death, there is a figure, uh, a yaoi, a shaman, a ritual specialist basically, sitting with his, his eyes closed and that is also an indication of this idea of a dream state or a trance state. And so there are lots of different symbols basically in that passage in the Donny Dea Codex that indicate, I suppose, the experience of doing a ritual like that in such an important place, you know, necessitated, which was a different, an altered mindset, basically. And one enters the Soneric world for what for what purpose? So so they would enter the Soneric world to, to prepare for this ritual, but what was the end goal of the ritual? The idea is that there is a connection in ancient Mesoamerica and and still in the way that uh, contemporary people um, understand reality in lots of indigenous communities in Mesoamerica, uh, in which the spiritual worlds or the ancestral worlds are much more connected to our experience of being than perhaps a, you know the average Western mindset would allow for. And the idea is that you can communicate with ancestral worlds, you can actually draw on some of the power and imagination of of your ancestors of of the forces that inhabit the sacred landscape um, and you can draw on those forces and draw on those experiences to strengthen your psychological position and that prepares you for i suppose tasks that you might be afraid of or tasks that require a certain concentration or a certain uh, resilience. And and so you mentioned that this is pretty common in, in Mesoamerica. So what other cultures in Mesoamerica, what other communities um, historically used to use hallucinogenic drugs? So it's actually something that's common across ancient Mesoamerica. Um, and we see that in lots of iconography and sculpture in the pictorial manuscripts. One example, just from the top of my head, is the ancient, well, or classic Maya, which is a, a region to the south of the Mishtek region. Uh, both Yucatan, Chiapas, and then part, Guatemala, Belize, parts of El Salvador. There, I happen to know that it's a a frog's venom uh, that was used to to induce hallucinations. Also, uh, Jimson weed is another example. That's a sort of flower. It's a datura flower, and it also has hallucinogenic properties. There are three sculptures that are part of one particular programme and two of them are at the British Museum. Two of them are on display in the Mexico Gallery and the other one is on display in the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico. Um, but in, it, it depicts a very powerful woman from the Maya area, Lady Shock. And in each of these different sculptures, she's wearing a different dress. And in one of the dresses, she is shown with flowers on her dress and in one of the dresses she's in the in another she's wearing frogs on her dress uh, and one of the interpretations and there are obviously various ones is that these are both representations of of an of an oniric world of a relationship to ancestors through trance states induced by hallucinogenic substances like flowers like frogs Archaeological evidence indicates that visionary mushrooms have been used for at least 3,000 years in Mesoamerica. The main uses recorded for indigenous peoples are 1. Sacred or ritual uses, 2. Therapeutic uses, and 3. Divinatory uses. 
Osiris Sinue González Romero is a researcher of the Center of Cultural and Historical Research of the Ministry of Culture in Hidalgo, Mexico, and also a member of the editorial board of the Chacruna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicine in San Francisco, California. Listen to Osiris discuss how old the practice of using hallucinogenic substances is throughout Mesoamerica and the importance of understanding what they are used for. The oldest recorded mushroom ritual is found in a codex of mystic origin. A complex ceremony is depicted on plate 24 of the so-called Codex Bindobonensis, Codex Yuta No. Various divine entities, such as the Rhine deity, the Wind deity, and the female personification of the spirit of the sacred mushrooms, are represented by the figures of Mrs. Eleven Lizard and Mrs. Four Lizard, both wearing mushroom headdresses. This process of personification of sacred entities is one of the central features of the ontology of indigenous peoples. Thus, it is necessary to take an ontological turn to better understand the sacred and ritual uses of psilocybin mushrooms. This implies recognizing that there are different ways of relating human beings and nature, other than the paradigm that prevails in Western culture. In the worldview of the native peoples, the earth, the mountains, the clouds, and of course the sacred mushrooms are entities endowed with, with life. Personality is attributed to them, and it is possible to establish communication through sacred and ritual language. This cultural feature is depicted in the Codex Nutal, Codex Tonindeye, on plates 60, 68, 70, 72, and especially 82. Recognizing this ontological pluralism, is the first step towards a better understanding of the cultural usage mentioned above. And how do these oneric worlds that you're referencing uh, coincide with different ontologies or different cosmologies or different worldviews? Um, the very point of the word ontology, which is not a word that I think most people use in their common conversation, is this idea of understanding a world that to us is not a reality. So we call reality something which is empirical, something which is exactly, you know, which is what science says, you know, that this is where the beginning and end of a, a material is, this is where the beginning and end of a, a body is, um, this, is the, this is the planet, this is where it is in the solar system, in the universe, etc. And that is a reality. And everything that is in a trance world or a spiritual world or something which is invisible or something that cannot be empirically proven is automatically a belief system, it's automatically a trance, it's a dream, it doesn't exist. In a sense, that's what people find so difficult to understand in these kinds of historical documents like the Donindeya Codex. It's supposed to be a historical document. So why are they talking about trance states or dream states? Um, to what extent is that history? That's a story for people in the Mishnah region, for Lord Eight Deer. That trance-like state, that relationship to ancestors um, and to a spiritual world is a reality. That's at the crux, I think, of the idea of understanding a different ontology. It's having the respect for another culture to understand that where science to us is the beginning and end of reality, uh, that is our, our particular cultural conception. New King, Lord Eight Deer, and the great Tolta Quetzalcan now journey to new lands for conquest and for glory, for brave deeds to tell stories of and for meeting with the sun god. Traversing great mountains, crossing great lakes, battles and adventures won. After one such victory, that sun god, Lord One Death, grants a cryptic vision. The two kings see three houses, three temples, three powers in the alliance. One was the temple of the Tolte king, but the others are not temples of Lord Eight Deer, as these two powerful kings are expecting. They are places of no significance. The town of Flint, the town of pointed objects, nothing places with no great rulers. What does this mean for the two kings and the friendship? And as they will their despair into the sun god's sky, Lord Eight Deer catches a further vision, his loyal shadow approaching. From behind the mighty four jawer, out of his sight, Lord Twelve Movement, fully armed in the garb of a warrior. A new omen, mysterious, unsettling, 
a seed sown of thou in a deer of his shadow, an unknown, unshaved vulnerability exposed, and a foggy, confusing, but inescapable dread. Nothing happens. Life goes on, and the conquests continue. But the doubt see takes root, unless the moon rises and sets and waxes and wanes, a secret hatred grows. Do you know examples of contemporary cultures in Mesoamerica that, that still access this oneric world um, through different hallucinogenic drugs? Yeah, it's still it's still common um, in a lot of in a lot of communities in Mesoamerica. In fact, it's common across uh, Latin America. So, for example, in Amaz- in Amazonia, there's the use of ayahuasca, the use of peyote in uh, in the mountainous regions of central Mexico, uh, and in Oaxaca, in in the in the Mazatec region, people still employ hallucinogenic mushrooms. People who are healers, people that need to reach these oneric worlds or these dream worlds in order to heal themselves or heal others. Yeah, interesting. And and obviously, all of us here have heard a lot about how people now go to Latin America and and use these drugs and and have these out of body experiences. Um, but what do you think is like the big issue with with tourists going to use these drugs and and not really understanding? their ancestral use? I think arguably, um, as someone who's worked in Mesoamerica with, uh, with ritual specialists for a long time, I think it's, it's even anthropologists or people who think that they understand these different worlds that, that don't, that still enter this kind of intellectual realm with the idea that they want to study something which is different and not in any way living in that same life world that that they that they study automatically distances them from that reality that I'm talking about, making that engagement and that interest just as, if you want, problematic or unreal as a tourist who wants to experience hallucinogenic drugs with a ritual specialist in Mesoamerica. Actually, the Mixtec region, well, the Mazatec region, Huautla de Jimenez, um, which is in this, which is also in the Sierra and Oaxaca, is the place of, in a sense, first encounter with hallucinogenic drugs uh, in the 1950s. So it's a woman called Maria Sabina, who's a curandera, who is a, a healer. And she famously allowed a a Western traveler to to be involved in one of her rituals that included uh, hallucinogenic substances. And it became famous because the, the, the guy um, published the story in Life magazine and she, it became the region where she lives, um, Wautla, the, which is the town, um, and she herself, Maria Savina, became a kind of international sensation. It's, it's rumoured that the Beatles went to visit her in the 1960s. Uh, lots of different celebrities, basically. Um, and actually, I went there with my with my dad to do an article about it when I was a teenager. And I remember some of her uh, relatives speaking to them. And this is sort of to answer your question about um, whether or not it's OK that tourists come. Well, they think it's OK that people are interested in their culture and that will come and experience it with them. And yet they were slightly dismissive about the idea of people coming just to have fun and kind of like flake out because obviously a um, Western conception in many cases, not all the time, but in many cases, a Western conception of drug use is one of, you know, letting go. It's, you know, it's just for fun. It's to be wild. It's experimentation. It's not culturally specific. It's not obviously it's not spiritual ritual necessarily, but it's, yeah, it's perhaps a shallow engagement with what the meaning of hallucinogens are. I mean that's a gen- that perhaps a generalization, but I, but that's I think what people fear because they fear that people, let's say from countries with more money, are coming to small towns, you know, in in the valleys of central Mexico, and southern Mexico, and you know, get basically paying very little money to get high and sort of disrespect that public space, and I think there's also a fear among people in in places like Weltla that people there are people actually in the village who are kind of not real ritual specialists and not true ritual specialists that are kind of marketizing their ancestral culture and so selling it to tourists etc so yeah there's there there is a lot of critique around that on the other hand it is something that people 
travel to to do that to do those things and to get to know that culture and i think there will be probably lots of people who argue that that is both an economic bonus for them as much as it is also a demonstration that they are interesting to an international audience that's arguably not the worst thing the trouble is that this kind of engagement often ends in tragedy right because if you aren't taking hallucinogenic substances in taking the appropriate measures basically which in theory, a ritual specialist can help you to do. But if you're not doing that, then they're dangerous, especially in, 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 in somewhere that you just don't know. Different town, different country, different language, different substance. Based on the ontology of the indigenous peoples, mushrooms are not to be considered a drug or psychoactive substance, but rather a sacred beings or entities with which reciprocal relationships are established. It is also worth mentioning that mushrooms are not detached from the territory. They are an integral part of the sacred landscape. Finally, it is worth noting that psilocybin mushrooms allow communication with ancestors and other supernatural or extra-human beings, such as the guardians of hills, caves, springs, or forests. The recognition of ontological pluralism is not an exclusively theoretical or scholarly matter. Still, its understanding allows for a better comprehension of the struggles for territory. It is also helpful for a critical approach to some controversial issues of the so-called psychedelic renaissance, such as biopiracy, patents, and cultural appropriation. What other ways do um, people enter the oneric world or enter these like trance-like states? Um, there are lots of ways, and I think I think we don't know many of them. But I would say, which is interesting and relates to what I was telling you earlier about the sculptures, the Yashilan sculptures that are in the British Museum's collection that have the, the women with the, with the dresses and one's wearing a, a dress with flowers and another is wearing a dress with frogs. In one of these sculptures, you see Lady Shock pulling a rope full of thorns through her through her tongue. You also see this ritual behaviour in the Tonindé Codex, uh, bloodletting. And you see, we see the implements that would have been needed for bloodletting in the archaeological record, stingray spines, for example. Um, and, wh and what it is, is that in ancient Mesoamerica, there was a widespread practice of offering your, your life essence in the form of your blood to, to I suppose, its uh, ancestral forces or, you know, to a sort of... God, to use a word that's more familiar to us. Certainly, bloodletting would have made people feel slightly uh, between, I think, the pain and also uh, losing and losing blood. And I suppose also the concentration and the ritual aspect of any of these things that kind of puts you in a different mindset. Um, it would have triggered another of these kind of, let's say, hallucin hallucinations or visions or, or an oniric world. So in that sculpture that I'm telling you about, Lady Shock, she pulls the thorns um, through her tongue. She lets blood and the blood falls down on a piece of paper, which is burnt. And so the offering kind of goes into the air. And then she receives a vision um, of someone that we think is an ancestor. This comes back to what we were saying about this idea of ontology, right? And whether it's reality or ontology. So the way that the, the, that kind of image in which people bloodlet and then they are in sort of hallucinations or their envisions. Um, is that real or is that, you know, them basically being high? The idea is that I think from a Mesoamerican conception, what you experience when you're high is is real. It's as real as everything else. It's just that you're accessing a different world. And so the, the bloodletting ritual, is that something that's also practiced today? Uh, I, I don't know of any bloodletting rituals as per se, no. And I think obviously a lot of uh, Mesoamerican religion was eradicated uh, through the processes of evangelization with the arrival of the Spanish. Um, what I can say, though, is that there are examples in the Mixtec region and, and elsewhere in Mesoamerica of the, offering the blood of animals, for example, um, birds. So it has maybe the same symbolic meaning, but not the same like physical response. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. But then there are other ways to achieve that sense. Um, and, we, and, you know, anyone who, who practices any kind of um, fasting, for example, uh, in, relig- in, you know, world religions, uh, knows that there are lots of ways to induce trance-like states or, uh, or dream states or other ways of experiencing the world. Not drinking, not, not eating, long pilgrimages, lots of, like, you know, heavy exercise, repetitive action, artwork to some extent can elicit an, a, a different way of understanding the world, right? Anything that, that taps into your senses and kind of removes you from perhaps banality. Now picture Temazcal, a house of hot stones where Lord to our movement has gone for a cleansing ritual. A special sweat bath. There's a fire outside. Stones worn by the flames, taken into the dark hut and laid in the center. Water poured, turned to steam on these stones. Clothes shared, door closed. Darkness and warmth. And a healer man there to stimulate this Lord's life force with the lash of cut branches. Energizing relaxing and pleasurable but not on this day and amongst those cut branches a blade in the darkness and the healer not healing but thrusting and stabbing and spilling Lord 12 movements life force across the hot stones the loyal shadow killed in the shadows stabbed in his nakedness in sweat and in steam the healer flings the door open, rushes out and away. There are no people who hear it, no people who see it, but the sun is watching over. The sun shines, the sky seeing all, judging all, and there will be retribution. The sun will see to that. In the next episode, we're going to talk about sound, music and landscapes. So we'll be discussing an artwork, which is mostly sound based, inspired by the Donindea Codex. We'll get an in-depth look at the artwork's context, as well as some of the instruments from the British Museum's collection. We'll also walk you through the exhibit that recently closed in London dedicated to that art piece. Thank you for listening and until next episode. The epic of Lord A. Deer was read aloud by Miguel Villegas Ventura. This created reinterpretation, scripted by Jack Monaghan, is based on the Toninteye and other mystic codices that mention Lord A. Deer's story. We are particularly indebted to the book Encounter with the Plumbed Serpent, Drama and Power in the Heart of Mesoamerica by Martin Jensen and Gavina Aurora Perez Jimenez, and the play Recreation of the History Told in the mystic Codices by the community theater Yo Onyu Sabi, directed by Maria Ofelia Porras Lescas. This podcast season is made possible by the generosity of Alejandro and Charlotte Santo Domingo and Mrs. Julio Mario Santo Domingo with Andres and Lauren Santo Domingo. If you want to know more about the Santo Domingo Center, please visit SD Cellar website, stcellarbritishmuseum.org. This podcast was recorded, engineered, and edited by Prong Productions. For more information on Prong, please visit prongproductions.com. That's P-R-O-N-K productions.com.